Yeah, they were getting back to the Red Sea. Uh, sort of like the Lulin had it died, Muslim body went back to letting things work. So I'm going to pass the, the mic to Sheikh Ibrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. Uh, we always we begin with the praise of Allah. We send our peace and greetings upon the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We testify with conviction and firmness that we declare our worship of Allah, and that we dedicate our life to spreading a message of peace and truth, as was sent by the first uh, of our Ummah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in in conformity to his way of life. Now the topic that's been chosen is an ambitious topic. Yahya Ibrahim's guide to the galaxy. Like not just to earth, like beyond. So we'll do our best with that. And I kind of thought we'd stop off at different planets. So we're going to definitely stop off at Venus, which is our Muslim sisters. We're going to take a look at... You know, some of the things the brothers need to know. Now, I'm not an expert, but I am married. So I'm kind of certified. We'll also start off, stop off at Mars, which is uh, traditionally, you know, they say men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? So we'll look at Mars. We'll look at some of the things that sisters need to know about men. Factual uh, things that we can... Uh, point out inshallah and then we'll round around the galaxy and look up into the heavens the distant distant stars the things that are so far away that they seem with out of touch that are beyond us at times and that we recognize that as far as we can travel that there are limits that are set for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so those are really the three steps that we want to look at today so let's begin with the first. Gentlemen, I have some information for you. Sisters are weird. Uh, the ladies are different to how you and I think. And we have, alhamdulillah, a lot of sisters here today who will say, yes, that's me. I am one of the weird ones. In comparison to you as a brother. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that He created people as waja, in partners. Now this is something important, you know, when we study science, you come to recognize that there are laws to how the world exists. And some of those laws, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, had not yet come into being. People had not yet discovered them. They didn't know that there was a male and a female, for a lack of better words, uh, pollinators. They didn't know that there's a male and a female tree. They didn't know that there's male and female in atoms, or that there's a positive and a negative. And that for everything that's created, there's an opposite to it. They didn't know these things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, خَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja." We created everything, and a part of that everything is you, azwaja, in pairs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He created men for women and women for men. But we're all created from the same soul. And Allah tells us in Surah An-Nisa at the first verse, O you who believe, O mankind, خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِن نَفْسٍ wahida. We created you from one soul. And therefore this has some existential, you know, uh, higher level uh, metaphysical uh, things that really we need to consider. One is that you and I are all linked. And you're not just linked to each other in spirit, but you and I are linked in our physical being. In another word, the food that you eat that has come out of the earth... It carries the same nutrients and it is made of the same thing that you are made from. And the earth that you step on and the ground that you walk on is you. That's you. You're made from that organic material. You're made from that carbon and sulfur, from that water, from that hydrogen, from that oxygen. When you come to that recognition 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you as well in the Qur'an, He created you, خَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ مِّن مَا Everything can trace its origin back to water. Uh, any science students here with us today? What's the sun made out of? What's the sun? It's hydrogen, right? And that hydrogen is exploding and becoming helium. And once all the helium is exploded, it'll turn into something else, right? The next element down the chain. I've actually forgotten. It's weird. What is it? Hydrogen? Okay, anyway. Geochemistry failed me. Right? So there you are. This is what you're made of. You're made from the same thing that the sun is made. You're made from the same thing that's in the stars. And part of discovering who you are is looking outside yourself. In Islam and in spirituality, it's called tafakkur. Fikr is reasoning and understanding. Tafakkur is using it to discover your place and purpose in life. I want you to think of a moment when Ibrahim, the Prophet of Allah, stood on a mountain, Abraham, thousands of years before Muhammad wasallam, And he looked up and he could see that his people, the people who lived amongst him, there were those who were worshipping idols and worshipping all these other things. And Ibrahim he says, look I want to show them, it's not just that I don't want them to worship idols, but they should understand that there's a greater concept to my creation and their creation. So he says to them, رَأَى كَوْكَبًا Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, He looks up and he sees a planet, a star, a shining bright star. قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي he says to all the people seated, seated there, that's God, that's my God maybe. And they said, oh perhaps. And then he said, no, 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 hold on a second. The sun's rising, that star's going to fade. It can't be my God. فَلَمَّا أَفَلَتْ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ I can't worship something that's going to depart from me. Something that shows itself from a distance and hides. So he waits and the next day the moon is shining bazigan. It's a full brilliant moon. And he's standing on the mountaintop and he goes, maybe that's God. And then he goes, no, no, the moon's going to set, it's going to depart. It's going to get smaller and smaller and then it'll return and get bigger and bigger. And it'll get smaller and smaller and return and get bigger and bigger. It's not its own self, it doesn't have its own determination. So he looks to the sun and the sun sets. And then he makes the dua that you and I make every day in prayer. Every time we recite the Fatiha. لَإِن لَمْ يَهْدِنِي رَبِّي If my Lord doesn't guide me, لَأَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الضَّالِّينَ I'll be from those who are led away from the truth. And that's why in prayer you recite Surah Al-Fatiha. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ Don't make me, O oh Allah, guide me. Don't make me from those who have angered you or have been misguided and led astray. So therefore we come first, our first stop on earth is to recognize you and earth are made from the same thing. And Allah destined for you to be a part of this life and to walk upon this earth to make yourself and to discover within yourself that you are also beyond this earth. So almost every surah that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the first few years of his message, the first few years of revelation, were all given this allegory of the rising sun and the disappearance of darkness. So the first surah revealed to the Prophet is Iqra, read. And that tells you and I that the way to disappear the darkness and to keep the sun up and the light of your life present is learning, and wisdom, and understanding, and reasoning. And that you are not just this earth, but you have a mind, and have been given an ability to think. And you have a soul that you must nurture through that thinking and rationalizing. And Allah tells you in the Qur'an, اقرأ بسم ربك Read in the way of your Lord, الذي خلق Who made you what you are. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقَ He created you a forgetful being, insan. But He created you not just from the earth, 
but has made you come out of your mother's womb. Iqra, read again. Continue to study. وَرَبُّكَ akram, And your Lord will ever be generous to you. In all your difficulty, in all your trouble, your Lord is always generous. الَّذِي عَلَّمَ بالقلم, The greatest generosity bestowed upon you and I, is that Allah taught us by the pen. And therefore the first thing given to Adam, that elevates him and makes him worthy of the prostration of the angels to him, عَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا He taught Adam the nature and name of all things. Meaning that you and I as human beings, inherit from Adam the capacity to discover knowledge. While all other creation are not able to discover it, they are taught it by Allah. So the angels are lesser than you. Why? Because anything they know was told to them, do this. But everything that you seek from Allah, you choose it. عَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا your honor, اقرأ وربك الأكرم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم He taught man what he didn't know علم بالقلم He taught us by the pen سبحانه وتعالى So now you're on this world You're in this planet And you're in this time But you didn't choose who your parents are Where you would be born And whether you would have prosperity or adversity you come into this life as Allah tells you in the Qur'an. You come out of your mother's womb, لا تعلمون شيئا Once again, knowledge. You come out knowing nothing. You're unable to hear or see or understand. Your heart is weak, meaning your heart of perception doesn't know. Your eyes are nearly blind. When you have your children, you'll come to realize that they could see you but only when you're close initially. It takes a couple of months to be able to see you from like two meters away or three meters away. But what they know is what you sound like, what you smell like, who you are to them. And as soon as the mother gives birth to her child, doctors put that child on her chest for a very simple reason. The babies heard her heartbeat for nine months. And the moment it touches her chest, it hears that rhythm again and says, I know you. I know you, hold me, don't leave me. And it stops crying. You become to get aware. يَأَخْرَجَكُمْ مِن بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةً From that moment on, Allah is the one who gives you hearing and sight and intuition and knowledge and an ability to think. So you begin to grow. And Allah asks you as a young person, as the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ says, the best of humanity and those who will be given mercy by Allah on the Day of Judgment, شَابٌ نَشَأَ فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ Someone who's groomed in age and rises in their youth up to adulthood under the sanctity of Allah, knowing Allah, knowing their place. And every one of the Prophets of Allah went through that mission. And every one of righteousness endured that mission. When you understand that Ibrahim was 14, 15 years old when he confronts his father. Why do you worship what doesn't help? What is immovable? Why do you worship something that doesn't make sense? And his father can't answer with a rational answer. He has that intuition that he knows that there's more to life than what they are told and what they have been given. And therefore your first primary purpose in life is to study. Now I know your parents, they say this for the young ones. Study. But see, studying chemistry and math, it's not just to sharpen your mind, but it's to lead you to Allah. See, one of the things that we need to find within ourselves is a place where we feel comfortable with who we are. And you feel comfortable with who you are when you've attained something that you worked hard for. It could be something like a degree, or it's something where you, you know, you wanted to attain a job, or find a vocation, or, you know, build a business, or set up mocha cafe. And you're like, I'm gonna do something. 
And it doesn't have to be something big in other people's eyes. It only has to be noteworthy in your life. And each and every one of us, we have that purpose in life. Don't think that your purpose has to be limited just by what people estimate as being virtuous. In fact, virtue is in what you see as being something that you put your effort and energy towards. And therefore, knowledge becomes the key. So the first rule of success in this worldly life is to learn. And the sharper your mind, the sharper your body, the sharper your intellect, the sharper your wealth, the more powerful your resources, the greater your effective good is, inshallah, in society. We board our spaceship and we fly off to Venus. And you land on that sister's planet. And the earth that we've just been talking about seems to be suspended. It's a reality that's not really a reality. So let me tell the brothers about sisters. Sisters, if I'm wrong, you, you put your hand and say, Brother Yahya, you're wrong. Hopefully I'm right. But hopefully you want us to know that I'm right. You don't want to hide that I'm right. Sisters are emotional beings. Sorry, sisters. What does emotional beings mean? They memorize things, and you know, I kind of talked about this in my course if you were there. Sisters link things and remember things not by date or by color or by shape. They don't remember the event, they remember what they felt during it. And there will be moments, I guarantee you, my young brother, if you are not married yet, you're going to mark my words. I tell you, your wife is going to say to you one day, I can't believe you did that. You say, what did I do? She says, I don't know, I, I can't remember what you did, but it made me feel bad. She remembers what she felt. She doesn't remember what you did. Now that's going to puzzle you. Because you don't keep track of how you feel. You know, a brother hangs up on you on the phone... And you're like, oh, that, that was kind of rude. What, what's there to eat? That's how you are, right? <laughs> it, it's like the emotional attention span of a three-year-old. Right? A sister, someone hangs up on her phone, she's like, oh my God. Did they just do that? I can Okay, I'm calling Aisha. Aisha, can you believe what she just did to me? She hung up on me. Are you sure? Oh my God. Are you sure? What did, exactly what did she say and how did she hang up? Right? That is emotional. It's emotion. How she felt hurt her. And later on, it could be three months down the road. She's forgotten the whole incident. But she feels that same kind of emotion again. And what happens? She remembers the incident. You've forgotten about it. But it's back in memory because for sisters they have, you know, it's like a USB portable plug-in hard drive. It's always random access memory is available. She's always plugged in. She can retrieve the information immediately. Venus is online. <laughs> always online. They have backup support, cloud support. <laughs> it's, you know, they have two hard drive support. It's there. You're not going to escape it. So you're going to be puzzled in life because you're not, you may not remember this, but inshallah you do. Sisters have an emotional memory. Now brothers are different. Brothers, they don't remember what they felt, they remember what they did. Who said what, when, and where. Uh, any of you ever ask a girl or your sister or your brother, you know, your wife or whatever, you say, oh, what happened? She says, well, this is how it starts. Well, before I tell you what happened, I was with Aisha, and we were having coffee. No, 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 no. What happened? Well, I'm telling you what happened, but you have to understand what happened before what happened. Because <laughs> you have to understand the whole picture of what happened. So I was with Aisha, and she ordered cappuccino. And I was like, are you sure? Because it's like a cat. How are you going to sleep at night? No, no, no. What happened? 
I'm telling you what happened. Just listen. And then you'll say, I can't wait. So you rush it. And that makes your wife feel you're not listening. It's not that you're not listening. It's that she's talking. <laughs> you're listening, but she's over talking. To you, that's you. That you're in your mind. I'm listening, but I can't listen to like everything. So you begin to drift in and out. And men drift in and out, in fact, with, in some of the things. And you learn to do this. You say, oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. She goes, are you listening? You say, yes, yes. And you begin to have that pattern of yes. And you forget things that they said because you weren't actively listening. Because they were over-talking. Sisters, over-talking. We have to work on that. We'll get to that, inshallah, when we talk about Mars. So emotional, their communication is a little bit different to us. They speak not just in facts, A, B, C, equal D. They say A, then subscript A, but then A was subtracted because B had to be multiplied, and then they divided, somehow they got to D. Somewhere down the road, right? It's not a logical flow. Third thing that you need to know about Venus, it's hot. It's really close to the sun. And sisters get hot, angry, but they don't glow hot. They get angry, smoldering hot. So on the surface, they look cool, but internally, it's a volcano. Now these volcanoes erupt at times without notice. You look at your watch, you say, is the volcano going to erupt? No. There's no volcano scheduled for July. But there is one, you just don't know. The earth starts shaking. There's something brewing. And you didn't pick up on the signs. So here are some of the signs that the sister from Venus is going to blow up into a volcano. First sign, sisters, am I wrong in what I'm saying so far? I'm correct? Wrong? So, okay, wrong in some? Uh oh. <laughs> Alright. First sign that there is an imminent volcanic eruption. The birds, the cats, everything runs away <laughs> because of the silence. There's eerie quiet. You're like, <laughs> it's so quiet what's happening the cat knows what's happening it can feel seismic tremors that are imperceptible to you there's a volcano soon to erupt quiet you ask her you okay she's like yeah are you sure yes the over talking part is no longer over talking so you're like uh oh why is my wife not talking? She talks too much normally. There's a big problem. Volcano. Second problem. The volcanic eruption is now the lava is rising. The second indication is that when you ask, is everything okay? Are you sure everything is okay? Please just tell me, is, did I do something to bother you? You ask and ask and ask and ask and you get either a smile or a nod or I'll be fine. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Yes. Short one word statements. The love is rising. The explosion comes when you're asked to do something and you have a legitimate reason and you say, I can't do it. Normally, under normal circumstances, you can get away with it as a brother. Yahya, can you fill up the laundry machine? Yes, yes, but I'm really late for work. Uh-oh. You didn't notice that she was quiet. 
Yes, I'm okay. There's no problem. You expect me to do all the work by myself? <laughs> what work? What What do you mean? I, I'm late. I, you know, I, I'm really late. Do you think I raised these kids on my own? Did I have these kids on my, by myself? We are a partnership. And that means the volcano is now in active eruption. How do you stop a volcano from erupting? You can't, you run. Run, brothers. Run. Get on a boat. Leave. Let the lava flow a little bit. Make sure you're still positive. Always check. Send SMSs. Flowers. Candy. Call. Do your best. That's Venus. Mars to my sisters is a little bit different. Our brother, do you mind if I share some of our secrets? <laughs> it's okay? Okay. For the sisters who don't know, brothers by nature are disorganized. My wife will tell you that she will have told me a hundred times where she thinks my shoes should go. But I know where my shoes should go. She knows where she thinks they could go. But I know where they should go. And it is in the most convenient place for me to take them off. If it's by the door, yes, I know someone might trip on them. But it's inconvenient at times to bend down and pick them up and put them on a shelf. That's a brother. Men are like that. Inconvenient. Inconsistent in that. Second, we as brothers will do only as much as we are expected to do. We rarely, rarely, rarely volunteer. Do you volunteer? <laughs> You'll volunteer if someone calls you to volunteer. Even uh, my brother Zuhri, one of the brothers Zuhri, he was saying, uh, you know, I have four or five dependable brothers. They give food, mashallah, to the poor people, right? And they go out into the city and they give food to the poor people. He goes, I give them one call and they come. I say, you call them or do they call to ask when you're going? He says, no, I have to call. <laughs> of course. We're brothers. That's how we are. You go to an Islamic class, 70 out of every 100 seats are filled by sisters. Why? It's not because the brothers don't have the time. It's because it's not a must. So you only do as much as you think is necessary. So for you, my dear sisters, you're going to have to nag us. And you're going to have to say, do this, do this, do this, do this, because sometimes it won't get done unless you tell us. Do this, do this, do this. Yahya, do the laundry. Oh my God, I can almost hear my wife. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't mind filling the... You know how easy it is to fill the laundry machine? But it's so tough. <laughs> like it's so easy, but it's really tough. Like you have to separate colors. Black on one side, white on one side. I don't, who has time for black and white? <laughs> Typical, isn't it? Right? Men from Mars are also non-emotional beings. I can try to... I, I can, sometimes I can reach out to my feminine side. But naturally, men are non-emotional. We try our best not to be emotional. Which is in the sense that we hold in what we feel and then bury it. And someone will ask, usually your wife or your, you know, someone close to you and she'll say, How do you feel? You look, what do you mean? What kind of question is that? I feel okay. No, how does your heart feel? My heart feels fine. I went to the doctor yesterday. <laughs> what do you mean, my heart? Yeah, yeah, I'm there for you. There where? You're right here. There where? Like for what? It's okay. It's alright to feel emotional. I'm not emotional. I'm fine. And for us as men, emotion, see, it's like a dirty word. If a man cries, it's like, oh my God, he cried. That's rough. How? It seems unbecoming. And we try to hold it. Have you ever seen a man crying in front of a woman? He's like, <laughs> no, I'm not. 
I'm hiding. You know, you hide. You don't want to allow to be made to seem weak or emotional. And at times, sisters will use that against us. And at times, you will use that against your wife. We now have the collision of Venus versus Mars. Which is the greater planet? I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Marriage is really another word for war. No, like, it's, have, you, have you ever played Battleship? Who's going to sink whose Battleship? It's very tactical. Uh, any brothers play uh, Modern Warfare? You know how you have to have a sniper? You have to have a sniper. You call on the sniper. I need tactical support. Send in the RC. It's necessary. And it's necessary because there's a give and take all the time in married life. And when I say war, I don't mean it as a dirty war. Nuclear weapons and all that. You as a brother, you're going to send in artillery. And it's going to happen. You're going to get into an argument with your wife. And you're going to go... Ah! You're going to shoot the rockets. Sam sights. Bang, 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 bang. Called in the aircraft carrier. And the sister is going to... You know, I told them yesterday. She's going to submerge herself like a submarine. A-class, Russian-class, nuclear submarine. Now you're looking for the submarine. Where is the submarine? She seems okay. Yes, I'm okay, honey. I'm fine. Be careful with that word, I'm fine. It's actually Hiroshima. I'm fine. Nuclear weapons are deployed in the water. Torpedoes are in the water. You don't know that. Your bridges are about to get burned. And when you're at war, when there's an argument, there's one aim. And that aim is, I win, you lose. That's not how it is for Muslims, of course. That's how it is, men and women. Who has the power? The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam gives us a completely different perspective. Because see, everything I just said there, I'm going to mention to you the Islamic treatment of it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet ﷺ remedies all of those insecurities that we have. Emotional, you don't want to seem weak. You don't want to cry in front of a spouse. You say, I'm fine, but you're not. You hide what you're really feeling, or you're quiet. You don't want people to know what you're really thinking. And that wasn't the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Fourth, you find that the Prophet sallallahu had a sense of dignity and keeping another person's dignity, especially his spouse, was always paramount. So you find all this lobbying of artillery and you go, ah, 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 ah. and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if he was standing in your position, he would be silent, he would be quiet. That's how he remedied our lifestyle. So let's look at how the Prophet ﷺ separates these planets and disengages us from the mistakes that we have in life. What is the ideal Venus and Mars? What is the ideal Muslim brother, Muslim sister? For us, our way of doing things is governed by the representation of the lifestyle of the Prophet. Let me tell you a story about the Prophet ﷺ and his wife. Uh, any of you guys read my article, The Sunnah of Love? No? Oh my God, that's a, I, feel, I feel bad that I even brought it up now. It's actually been read like 300,000 times. 300,000 hits. I thought there'd be one person in KL who's read it. Alright, this is your mission tonight. You go home, you Google. Yahya Ibrahim, The Sunnah of Love. Because it's actually a really inspiring tale from the life of the Prophet Muhammad At a time of war, in the middle of the desert, the Prophet and his army, they're trying to get back home, and they're surrounded by enemies, right? And in desert warfare, when it's hot, you travel by night, 
and you keep the sun uh, sheltered, you shelter in your tents by day. And in the middle of the night, as the Prophet's setting up, you know, uh, picking up camp and they're going to start their journey, they want to get out of this enemy territory. The Prophet Sallallahu wife, Aisha, she comes and whispers to him. She says, Oh Messenger of Allah, when I went over there, I lost my necklace. He asks, which necklace is it? She says, it's not an expensive one. It's not even gold or silver. It's just a black thread with black beads. But it had sentimental value to her. It wasn't worth anything. Now you would think in enemy territory with dwindling water supply, you can only travel at night. You can't travel by day. There's enemies trying to catch up to you. You would say, forget the necklace. Let's move on. If my wife and I were in KLIA airport, and she says, Yahya, I left my wallet in the t- uh, you know back in the hotel. I'm like, forget the wallet, forget the forget the watch. Let's go, get on the plane. We're going to Perth. I'll buy you another watch. Right? What does the Prophet Sallallahu do? He says, All right, everybody. Unpack your camels, we're staying here another night. Now the Sahaba, when they heard this, are like, what? Why? He says, you know, Aisha lost the necklace. They're like, oh, okay. Is it like really expensive? He's like, no, 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 it's a black one. Can you guys help her find it? Now could you imagine Umar ibn al-Khattab, this fierce warrior? <laughs> you know, when you read the biography of Umar, Umar was the kind of guy, literally, his size, he was a big man. When he sat on a horse, his feet touched the ground. That's Umar. Imlaq. He was like, large, powerful. And there he is, bent, in the desert, at night, in the dark, looking in the dark for a black necklace. So, you know, so are all these Sahab, they're wandering the desert. And then they start, of, of course, thinking, what, what are we doing? <laughs> who are we doing this for? For what reason? So who do they go to complain to? They complain to Aisha's father. Abu Bakr, man, what's going on? I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for battle. I'm looking for a necklace here. <laughs> now... We don't even have water. If we drink the water tonight, we won't be able to make wudu for fajr. And if we don't drink, we're going to die. We have to drink. Now up to that moment, tayammum, you know, getting ready for prayer without water was not yet taught. It wasn't yet taught to them by Allah. So they start grumbling. So Abu Bakr rushes over to Aisha. He comes to Aisha and the Prophet was asleep وسلم, in the middle of the night. And his head was in Aisha's lap. She had his head in her lap. She was combing his hair and stroking him وسلم, And Abu Bakr walks in the tent. And Aisha, how dare you do this? You should have told me, I'll get you another necklace. How could you inconvenience us? How could you put this burden upon the Prophet? We're going to go thirsty. And now if, we, if the Prophet wakes up and we don't have water, how's he going to pray? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Aisha's quiet. She doesn't answer. Because she's got a husband. I told my man. That's it. I'm, you're my dad, but he's my man. So, <laughs> that's it. So the Prophet ﷺ wakes up and he says, anyone find the necklace? They said, no. He says, all right. And they say, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, we don't have water. We're going to need to drink the water we can't make. We'll do because we have all day in the sun to live on that same water. We're not going to reach the well because we don't travel by day. So either we conserve the water and drink it or we make wudu and die. And just at that moment, Allah reveals Qur'an to the Prophet ﷺ, which is in Surah Al-Ma'idah. فَإِن لَمْ تَجِدُوا مَا أَمْ فَتَيَمَّمُوا صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا If you've run out of water, then make tayammum. Touch the ground with your hand. Purify yourself with the dirt, the natural earth which you're made of. And now you're ready for prayer. Guess what everyone said? Allahu Akbar, Aisha, she's the best of us. She always makes things easy for us. 
you know, Aisha and her father, wow, you guys are the best, look what you've done. We never would have gotten this if it wasn't for Aisha, she's amazing. Hamadu Aisha. Hamd is like, you know, he said, Alhamdulillah, Hamadu Aisha. Right? Now that shows you the Prophet ﷺ as being the total opposite of the normal Martian that we call man. Total opposite. He puts his wife and her simple need before a whole community and their great need. ﷺ. He would rather honor her because in honoring your wife, you will fulfill the needs of everyone else. That's powerful stuff. Now let's look at it in the opposite way. How Aisha returned that honor to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we'll conclude with that. So we have time for questions. Aisha sitting one day, and this lady starts to abuse her with bad words in front of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This lady, she was an old woman, kind of senile, whatever, maybe. And she just, Aisha, this, this, and that. And Aisha, who's able, eloquent enough to defend herself, because she's right to defend herself, she just waits. And she says, before I answered this lady, I looked to the Prophet Wasallam, And I saw in his face, if I answered her, he'd be upset with me. So I was quiet. Now that's powerful. That your wife, the woman that you love, monitors her emotion, her natural instinct to defend herself, especially when right, without you even having to say a word, just because she thought that if she did something, it would upset you. It's not because she fears the Prophet ﷺ, it's because she loves the Prophet ﷺ. That's amazing. So she's quiet. The lady leaves, comes back, says the same thing. Aisha, okay, that's second time. It's on. It's on like Donkey Kong. I can destroy her now. But she says, I looked at the Prophet, and I see in the Prophet's face, he'd be upset with me. I don't, I don't want to upset my husband. So I'd be quiet. Third time, she comes back, and the Prophet's like, okay, that's enough. Now it's too far. So in his face, she could see that if she defends herself, he's not going to be upset. So Aisha, she says, فَانْتَصَرْتْ The word in tasart in Arabic means, like I demolished her and took victory. Like I, it's like I danced on her grave. <laughs> like I destroyed her. So she went and knew not to come back. فَذَهَبَتْ وَلَمْ تَرْجِعَ She left after what I told her, and knew don't come back and mess with me. Especially in front of my husband, I'll take you out. That's exactly what happened. Now that shows you the opposite of what you see at times. That at times a, a person will say, I, I don't care what he thinks. I'm going to do what I... It's, it's right for me. I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't care what he thinks. No, that's the opposite to what you see with some of the women that live on Venus. So we'll leave the floor open for some questions inshallah. There's two other things that I want to talk to you about. We'll talk about them after we take some questions. Maybe they'll come up, uh, inshallah. Anything from the brothers or the sisters? Anyone want to share more stuff about the men from Mars? Ladies from Venus? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to sit in my copy until you ask a question. Thanks for the... Jazakallah khair. Is anyone with any questions, comments, anything to add? You keep one Khayr. How long you been married, Khayr? Alhamdulillah, a year and a half. And now I still understand why my wife keeps saying, you never listen to me. Because I told like, oh, you, I said, I didn't, when did you say that? I said, no, oh, last time remember I said that. I said, no, you didn't say that. Oh, no, you didn't. I was going to think of it. This is fair. Um, okay. I think I expect to elaborate on what 
we were going to be able to go in the next book. Okay, I can't remember the exact words about how you love Allah. No. It's, it's uh, how, like, how I can. Well, he's on the line, but I write things I can't remember. I know, I'm trying to get it on the Facebook, but it was sent to yeah, my Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. What did I write? <laughs> I honestly can't remember. While he searches that, thank you so much, sister, for all your kindness to my wife and my family. Allah barik fiqi. Now, for you, those of you who know uh, our sister, you would know, I'm sure you would already know her kindness, but subhanAllah, just, all right, okay. She says, don't say anything. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. No, the only reason I thank you is because Allah tells us, and the Prophet ﷺ teaches you can't be thankful to Allah unless you thank others. So this is, this is, you're welcome. Shukran. Thank you. What do I say on Facebook, man? <laughs> He's still looking. Something about Allah loves, uh, how Allah loves you is how you treat your wife or something. Ah, yes. Yeah. One of the signs to you that Allah loves you is that your wife loves you. Does that make sense? Any married brothers here? You'll know this if you're a married brother. The moment you're not good with Allah, something goes not right with your spouse. 100%. It's inescapable. No, no, I'm being serious. The moment you mess up a little bit with Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes your spouse to kind of, you and her kind of have a little thing. Why is that? Because Allah tells us in the Qur'an that from His signs to us is He created us as men and women from the same soul and He's the one that puts, He is the one that puts love between us. And the moment you disobey the one who places love, that love is raised or lessened. And one of the signs that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam he used to say to Aisha radiallahu anha, could you imagine the Prophet would actually know when Aisha was upset with him? He would say, Ya Aisha, I know you're not happy with me. He's a Prophet of Allah, but he's also a husband. He says, I know when you're not happy with me and when you are. She says, no, that's not true. I'm always happy with you. He goes, no, 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 I know. When are you, how do you know then? He says, when you're happy with me, when you make dua, you say, Wa Rabbi Muhammad, O oh Allah, by the Lord of Muhammad, Give me this or do that or help me with this. But when you're upset with me, you don't use my name. You say, وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَةِ By the Lord of the Kaaba, by the Lord of the Dawn. You don't say, وَرَبِّ Muhammad صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ And that shows you that there was that, you know, intimacy and sensitivity. But at the same time, there were challenges that was, was appreciated. So one of the lessons that we extract from this is, the more Allah loves you, the more your wife loves you. And invariably, the more Allah has distanced you from Him, the more troubles you have in your home. And therefore the Prophet Muhammad wasallam he says, خَيْرُكُمْ The best one in his nearness to Allah is the best in his treatment of his family. And I am the best in how I treat my family. Meaning because the Prophet is the best of the ummah. So therefore, he is also the best in his conduct with his wife. The closer you are to Allah, and the closer you are to the Prophet's conduct with his wife, means the closer you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you, the Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim, he says, if you want to know if you're from the awliya, see if your wife is a wali. If you want to know if you're a friend of Allah, see if your wife is your friend. Does that make sense? You want to be wali with Allah? Is your wife your wali? That's rough, man. <laughs> Scary. Allah help us. Alright, this is a this is a real question. If you're in a relationship that's different to marriage, how do you know when it gets real? Ooh. <laughs> wow. So if you're in a relationship, it's not, you know, you're not married, you're, you're seeing someone or whatever. How do you know if it's 
should be real or whatever. Look, I like to be honest and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, right? And sometimes uh, standards are different based on culture. And sometimes it's based on upbringing. But here's the bottom line. Anytime you're in a quote-unquote relationship, and that relationship is not what Allah and His Messenger Muhammad وسلم, allow or permit, not only is it sinful, but it's unproductive. It's going to hurt you. You know, why are there so many broken hearts? Because there's so many illegitimate relationships. Does that make sense? Like, Allah doesn't want your heart to break. He doesn't want a guy to mess around with you and break your heart. But you let it be done because you're not listening to Allah. So Allah gives you all these little things to help you along the way. He says, look, I want to protect you. Yuridullahu bikum al-yusr. Allah wants to make your life easy. He tells you in the Qur'an, مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى I didn't send the Qur'an to make things hard on you. Meaning anytime you're gonna go against what the Qur'an or what the Prophet ﷺ want, you're making it hard on yourself. First, sisters, uh, I'll talk to it from a sister's perspective. What do guys want? Especially teenage guys. Teenage guys don't want to talk. They want to see or to be seen with you. Because it's a source of pride. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I have a girlfriend. She looks like this. It's not she's smart, or she gets good grades, or she's from this family, or she's a good Muslimah. It's really shallow. She's hot. She's beautiful. She's this, she's, this, she's that, right? So guys want something to look at. And you, for young sisters, you want something or someone to talk to. Because we said, women, excuse me, over talk. You want someone to tell and share and, Oh my God, I have so much to tell you. He's like, yes, but can we do it face to face so I can see you? <laughs> right? So he wants to see her. She wants to talk to him and it's totally separate. And men don't want the same things as women. On a psychological level they don't. And on a physiological level they don't. From a physical level and from a thinking, emotional, uh, psychological level, two separate, totally different things. So anytime you put two people together who want two different things, you're never going to get the same outcome. The only way you're going to have something happy and pleasing to you is if both of you want the same thing. Both of you want a healthy relationship that's going to lead to marriage. Do you guys know how I got married? Do you want to know how I got married? I went on dates. Okay, I'll tell you about the dates. <laughs> You're like, oh, I went on a date? Oh my God. Alright. Now my wife used to work, she was an accounts manager where I worked. And before, I, I was a young guy, like 25. And I was just in Australia for three months. I thought, okay, I'll work at this place for three months. I was recruited, headhunted from back home in Canada. And my dad said, okay, look, you go. When you come back, you get married, inshallah, alhamdulillah. Finish your school and, you, you know, you're ready for marriage. I said, yes, yes. So when I went back to Canada in July, I used to have like three dinners a night at three different people's homes. So I could see different families and different people. And subhanAllah, there wasn't anyone that I liked. They were trying to find someone appropriate for me and this and that. They were all great people in case they watch this YouTube video. <laughs> they were amazing people, awesome people, the best people. But it just didn't happen, right? Because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, right? Wallahi, they were the best people. <laughs> and it didn't happen. 
So my dad goes, so what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, inshallah, some, you know. My dad had this fear. He thought, uh oh, if Yahya gets married or finds someone in Australia, he's not going to come back to Canada. My dad's fears were correct. <laughs> not because of that, but for other reasons. So I got back to Australia, and in my mind, I always wanted to marry someone who spoke Arabic. The only reason was because I'm lazy. Remember, I told you men will only do the bare minimum. I want my children to speak Arabic. Now, of course, I don't want to teach them, me. So I want a wife who's going to teach them. That's how men think. Sisters, beware. The easiest, oh yeah, well, how am I going to... You want me to teach them Arabic? No, you marry someone who speaks Arabic. That's how you teach them. There you go. You want them to learn Quran? You marry someone with Quran. You don't teach them yourself. That's how men are. Allah forgive us. All of us. Because I know how you all are. You all are like that. Don't lie to me. Allah is a witness of all of our hearts. It's true. But this sister, she was of a Turkish ancestry, didn't speak Arabic. But she was different to others in the sense that she didn't have <laughs> that kind of, you know, that, Salaamu Alaikum, brother Yahi, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> She, she was just like professional. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. You just get on with the work. That's it. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, how are you, sister? Whatever. That didn't look up. Nothing. So I was like, oh, that's nice. Because that's what you kind of want. You don't want someone who's, <laughs> you know, that. You don't want that. Because if it happens to you, it's going to happen with others. You don't want to have to have that happen with others. That's embarrassing. And I knew her brother. But it had never come to my mind because I always wanted to be lazy and have someone teach my kids Arabic. So I call up her brother. Her brother, his name is Genghis, which is scary. <laughs> you, really? Genghis? That's your name? Like Mr. Khan? Genghis Khan? The blood lord? The, 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 the killer? Yes. Be careful. I go, Genghis, do you want to go like do something? He goes, that's a strange question. We do stuff all the time. What do you mean? I go, you know, like do something. He's like, ah, oh, hold on, let me ask her. So he, hey, Yahya's on the phone. She's like, yeah. He wants me to do something. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, oh my God, how embarrassing is that? I'm asking a girl's brother out to a date. So she goes, yeah, go do something. He goes, yeah, okay, I can do something. He goes, are you going to come with your car? I go, yeah. He goes, no, no, don't bring your car. Now, it's not, I had a really terrible car. I lived three doors down from where I worked. I only bought a car because I used to like to scuba dive and I needed something to put all the scuba gear in it and it's sandy. And I bought the car for $400 and the driver's side, the passenger side seat didn't have any floor. I'm like, you have to sit like this. <laughs> no, seriously, you can see the ground under it, right? He goes, you're gonna bring that car? I was like, yeah. He goes, no, 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 don't, don't bring your car. I'll bring my car. I was like, alright. So we went out, had dinner, very romantic stuff, <clears throat> and he asked me questions. How long are you gonna be in Australia? Is that really your car? Can you afford another car? Or is that like the limit of your budget? I said, no, no, I can get a car. <laughs> you know, whatever. Ask all these sensitive questions that you expect to be asked. And then I had my feelings hurt. He didn't call back. Normally when you go on a date, you expect someone's going to call you back. One day, two days, three days. A week goes by. I felt terrible. Every day I go to work. Now this was important. Like her behavior didn't change. It was still, Salaamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salaam. Here's the work, here's this, here's that. There wasn't, Salaamu Alaikum, Brother Yahya. <laughs> How was Genghis's thing, you know, none of that. And I was like, wow, that's impressive. That's nice. So I call him. I go, I didn't get a call back from you. What's going on? Don't you like me? He goes, no, 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 no. Um, Look, why don't you come over from, for tea? I was like, tea? Wow. I'm going to have tea at your place? That's cool. I'm going to meet like the family. 
So they have this thing in Turkish culture that no one told me about. They should have told me about it, but no one did. The girl walks in, or the young lady walks in, with a single tray, and in it is a single cup, no sugar beside it. I like my tea a little bit sweet. She serves you directly, so that only you get that cup. Now in Turkish culture, if she likes you, she'll put extra sugar. So you taste it and it's sweet, so you're happy. If she doesn't like you, but doesn't want her family to know she doesn't like you, and or doesn't want to embarrass you in front of them, she might leave it unsugared, or if she really hates you, put salt. <laughs> So when the tea is served to me, I'm like, so I want to thank, thanks for the tea, and I, I'm holding the cup. And my dad always told me, you know, he, my dad's an engineer. He said, you have to try things. You shouldn't just add things because you think. And I actually remember, I remembered that. Like in my mind, why did you just try it? But before I tried it, I said, Genghis, and he was sitting at the next chair, can you pass me the sugar? He goes, no. I go, why? So all of this family, like aunts and all these people are sitting there, they start laughing at me. And I'm sitting there going, why is everyone laughing? It's just sugar, right? I go, why? He goes, look, just try the tea. I go, no, no, I like two sugars in my tea. <laughs> ya Allah, no one told me, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, just trust me. <laughs> try the tea. I was like, all right. So I take a sip, and I go like this. I go, man, that's so sugary, you were right. <laughs> so they fall on the floor laughing, right? And I go, why is everyone laughing? He goes, listen, I should have told you. I go, yes, afterwards, of course you should have told me. How do you keep that, you know, a secret? If she likes you, she puts extra sugar. So I couldn't even drink it, it was that sweet, it was like molasses. <laughs> so I rang my dad, and I go, Baba, there's a girl. He's like, oh no. <laughs> okay, who is she, what is she, you know, give me the details, give me their number, let me just get to know them. Does she have Facebook? <laughs> let me see, right, all that kind of stuff. And he goes, okay, I'm coming after a certain, you know, certain period of time, like a month. He goes, okay, when do you want me to come? I said, well, look, that was July. I told him that happened September, October, mid, for early October. He said, okay, I'm coming November, November 3rd, 4th, around my birthday. He flies in and he goes, uh, okay, where is she? I go, he just flew in. He goes, yeah, but I flew in for a reason. I go, don't you want to... He goes, no, 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 where is she? I said, okay, this is serious now. Wow, okay. She's over there somewhere. He goes, okay, let's go. I go, but... Okay, now? <laughs> He's like, you brought me all the way from Canada to ask me? And that's how men are. We get scared. Weak. Weak beings. I said, yeah, okay, let's go. I rang up. Yes, uh, my dad's here. He goes, no, where are you going? I said, I'm coming with you. He goes, I don't want to see you. Why, why are you coming? I go, what? He goes, I'm going to take her to a restaurant and I want to talk to her. I was like, oh my God. My dad's going to date my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so he literally asked to see her at a place. She came. And until now... I have no idea what they talked about. He refused to tell me, and she refuses to tell me. They made like some... And, and then he says, do you remember what I told you? And she goes, yes, Baba, I remember. I'm like, what did she tell you? What did you guys talk about? Still to this day, eight years down the road, don't know a word of what was spoken. He arrived on Wednesday. His first dinner at their house was Friday, which is the day I did my nikah. One meeting, one time with their family, he said they're a good family, marry him. I'm like, whoa, 
you're not going to ask mom to come? He goes, no, you're coming next week. He booked her, t- he said, you, you come, we'll do another nikah, in, like another thing in Canada. I got married November 18, nikah. November 25th, walima. November 28th, we flew out to Canada. That's how you get married. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> Literally. Anything other than what is effectively a goal in life is a waste of time. I want to get to know her, I want to get to know all that kind of stuff. We need to be boyfriend, girlfriend for a while. How am I going to be sure? Yeah, that's nice. But you're going to be sure when you're married, you're sure. I can guarantee you when you look at the statistics, because it's something that I've studied, those who get married with parental involvement early on in a quick marriage, their marriage lasts in comparison to those who date before marriage. Anytime someone has had multiple partners, I don't mean anything, you know, sexual. Multiple partners where they begin to get bitter. I got dumped. Why did I get dumped? Well, because of this reason or that reason. You know, I got this, I got that, I got that, I got that. It puts a burden on your soul and it makes life so much diffi- more difficult. And you carry so many more excessive bags. So for a question like this, about being teenage and you have needs and I want to, you know, how do I know it's real? If it was real, he would have seen your parents. If it was real, your dad and mom would have met his dad and mom. If he cared enough, he would at least have made that step. When the Prophet ﷺ married off his daughters, he went for the best. And he would go to this person and to Ali and to Uthman. Uthman married two of the daughters of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Ali married the other daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. He went to them. It was pointed out to him, this is a good man. Fatima, she says to him, Ali, Ali, he's a good man. Musa, that's how he got married. As a girl, don't feel shy and say, Baba, or this person's a good person. What, what would possess you to go to a degree where you say, I want to build a relationship, I want to go through so many text messages, so many Facebook, so many meetings, so many movies, and then doesn't work out. And do it all over again, then doesn't work out. And do it all over again, then doesn't work out. And you're going to say, brother Yahya, that just doesn't sound like, you know, easy. No, it's easy. When you're ready for marriage, get married. Really? That easy? Yes, when you're ready, get married. Look, get married, move on. Anything in between is unethical at times, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us with that. And you say that, you might be able to say, I'm going to do that, but how do you know that she or he is the one? You'll know that when you're married. Because when you're married, he or she is the one, it means they are the one. It's not they could be the one. No, they are the one because you're married. You're the, they're the one. They're the only one. Right? Yes? Do you understand what I mean? They are the one. It's not they could be the one. See, if, if it's anything other than that, it's, oh, is it him? But what if there's something better? You always think about something better. No, there isn't any better. Uh, when you look at some of the words that we use in Islam to talk about marriage, we call the person who gets married muhsan, fortified. It's like a, a, a fort. Muhsan. He's protected. He's, he's found what protects him in his life. She's found who's going to protect her in her life. That's marriage for us as Muslims. It's not convenience. So it's not, oh, are they the right one? If you want to get, are they the right one? Get the parents involved. And then take a little bit of time with the parents' knowledge. Early on, if it's not the right thing, it's not. But to just try out the... What's happening in Damansara? Let's see what's, 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 who's in Damansara that's available. Okay, oh no, no, no. Let's go to Bukit Jalil. 
No, it doesn't work that way. No. Salam Sheikh, you mentioned once in your tweet that Guru isn't broken but is a contact because the Prophet Salam, which is Aisha before he replaced, he replaced to happen on this. Thank you. In the authentic hadith narrated by Imam Muslim, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha reports, and Umm Salama reports, more than one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam report, that as the Prophet was going up to lead the prayer, meaning he would lift the curtain and go into the masjid, like it's not like he's walking a distance, it's just right there, he would kiss his wife before going. And part of the sunnah is to give your wife the greeting of entrance and departure. And that was done by the Prophet Sallallahu He would kiss his wife. And Aisha, she says, whenever the Prophet was going to pray, he would kiss me before he went to pray. And would not re- renew his wudu. And that was in response to a statement of, of one of the other Sahaba that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was, that the wudu is broken, if a, or the prayer is broken, if a woman crosses in front of you and, and, and things like that. Now, so that's the statement. As for the mother of Imam al-Shafi'i, which alhamdulillah is built also on an understanding of the sunnah, the mother of Imam al-Shafi'i is very simple. Any contact between a man and woman, even if it's fingernail, like if a fingernail, she's giving me change and her fingernail touches me. Some even within the madhab, they say even clothing doesn't even have to be uh, flesh on flesh. That contact that is intimate and near is breaks wudu. Uh, that's the opinion of Imam al-Shafi'i. He bases that on the statement in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La mastumun nisa. That if you touched a woman, touch means physical or come close to or touch. The other Imams they interpret it differently. Al Imam Abu Hanifa he says, La mastumun nisa ayba shartumun nisa anikaha that you had sexual activity with your wife. That's what's meant. So he goes to the other extreme. He says your wudu is valid up to and including... Yes. You know, complete sexual activity. Anything under, under that, your wudu is still valid. To Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Malik's in the middle. He said, sexual, uh, he said wudu is broken if the man touching the woman intends sexual activity, and if the woman being touched is receptive to a sex, his wife is being receptive to that sexual activity, and third, that it is skin on skin. And Imam Ahmed, which seems to be the correct opinion in the middle, is that mere physical contact, or uh, a kiss, or a hug, does not break your wudu, if it is not intending further activity with your spouse. Does that make sense? Yes. So if your wife says, here, take this to the market play, or here, go buy this, and her hand touches your hand, you don't say, curse you, now I gotta make wudu. <laughs> you know, throw the money at me, woman. Throw it at me. <laughs> get away. Don't touch me. You know, get, you're, you know, get garlic vampires. You know, that kind of thing. Right? So that seems to be the... the Median opinion, Wallahu alam. Of course, those who follow the more strict uh, opinion of Imam al Shafi'i have made sure that their wudu is honored and perfect. But there is evidence from the Sunnah, not just that hadith, but others, that when, the, when Allah says, La mastumun nisa, it means sexual activity or intent for it. Now, right. yes, sister. Mm. But we are taught that when you touch, the wudu is gone. Yes. In Malaysia, I mean... Yes. No, it's not in Malaysia. It's the opinion of Imam al-Shafi'i based on the interpretation of that verse in the Qur'an. No, no wrong, nothing wrong with that. That's the strictest opinion. You could stick to it, of course. You should stick to it. But if you come, for example, and come to my masjid in Perth, and I've just left home and hugged my wife or something. And to you, you may consider that's not a complete wudu, but I may lead the prayer and you pray behind me. 
You wouldn't say, no, astaghfirullah, I can't play behind this man. He hugged his wife. No, that would be too far. So being strict is not a problem. That's, that's valid, alhamdulillah. Uh, you be strict one week and not strict the second week and not strict the second week. <laughs> I really needed a hug <laughs> just for this week. <laughs> just today. It's valid. <laughs> Uh, look at talfiq, which is what you're asking about. Joining madhab to madhab has certain rules and certain uh, principles. It's really not its place because it's higher levels of usul. But basically, there are three rules that govern it. One is that you don't do it uh, just to find excuse for a given instance but you do it for every instance thereafter. So it can't just be for one week, yes, and then, oh no, I'm going to go back to the strict opinion thereafter. Uh, two, is that it's based on knowledge. It's not based on, oh, I heard. No, you have to be sure how to apply it. And third, when you're going to make talfiq, is that it's something that you don't enforce upon others. You don't say, oh no, this is now... Uh, we should leave off this opinion of Imam Shafi. Everyone do what I'm doing. No. Otherwise, yes, you can. Yeah? Inshallah. You're welcome. Yes, sister. Saw so what you mentioned regarding hardship and being very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, like this is there's nothing else that's going on in between that's not productive. Yes, sir. Um, how can you assure parents of today because there would be objections from all around because these kids are young. And on one hand, you don't want them to go to Sinai, you want them to just settle down. Mm-hmm. And because you said that whoever you settle down with would be the one that always chooses to you. Yes. But on the other hand, there would also be people who say, what, what are you going to feed your wife? You know, because you don't have the money or the knowledge or the experience yet. I'm not saying they have to get married young. What I'm saying is, don't mess around until you're, mar- you're ready. So... You don't have to start early, start mixing around with with people. You have to be more conservative. And that's really important for us, you know. Um, If you're not ready for marriage at age 18 or 19 or 20, it doesn't mean you should be dating at age 18, 19 or 20. How am I going to get to find the right person? Inshallah, you will find the right person. When it's time to get ready to find the right person, we'll find the right person. But it shouldn't be left open for them, okay, just have a little bit of, you know, whatever, until you're ready. So I'm not calling for early, early, early marriage. At the same time, we can't leave it open to anyone to do what they, you know, like, you know, alhamdulillah, no zina and and things like that. May Allah protect us. Uh, We can't leave that open as well, because it does bring bring many problems. It's not about marriage, yeah. No. Yes, we, uh, it's not being about being stricter, it's being more practical. Um, and I know for me, you know, I have, my sisters are 19, and uh, 19 years old, I have twin sisters, first year university, right? It's tough, man. And they live in Canada, so I'm not, you know, I'm not there, but everyone knows they're Sheikh Yahya's sister, and no, I'm just joking. You're watching, I mean, Mariam, watch. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, just <laughs> I'll send them the link. <laughs> uh, no, they look, uh, I've had this conversation with them. Their brothers, Yasser and Yusuf and Ibrahim, and my parents, and my mom, and my, you know, we have open conversations. What are our expectations? What, is, what are the limits? And those limits shouldn't shift based on. Uh, emotions or troubled times or how we're going through things in life they really need to be principles that we govern ourselves with one we don't date we don't go out and just free mingle and and, and just date and see how this feels and let's see how that feels in comparison to that we don't do that two when you're ready and if you're ready even if you don't think you're ready but you feel you're ready let us know and that way we can talk and see if you're ready and really ready or not, right? And three, we have to be proactive. Uh, you know, my brother, he I'm just saying if there's sisters, I'm not saying send in forms or anything. 
my brother Yusuf, mashallah, he's 24 years old. He's just finished his master's. He's uh, working for Glasgow. Uh, I'm giving you his CV now. <laughs> uh, he's a good guy. He's memorized, alhamdulillah, the Quran. He leads the prayers. He's a good young man. And I, had no, I have no shame in saying, I'm looking for someone for him. Now, it doesn't mean I'm like going to interview them or something. I'll say, Yusuf, this is a good person. What do you think? Say what you think. That is how we do things as Muslims. We have to look out for each other. And that's the proper way of doing things. So when someone's ready, you feel they're ready, we become really proactive. We say, we know this family and this family, and let's have dinner there, and let's go there, and let's do this. And yes, uh, there's nothing wrong in, in putting inquiries with different people. That's, that's the way it's been done in the past, and it should go towards the future. There's a bad stigma towards arranged marriage. I don't mean arranged marriage of four-year-olds. I mean arranged marriage where two families, a middle family, arranges it between them and introduces families to each other. That's our culture. That's how we've always done things, right? Across Muslim lands. You go to Somalia, you go to Kenya, you go to Egypt, you go to Malaysia, I'm sure. You have Al Khafib, the one who kind of says, Oh wow, your daughter, how old is she? She ready? I have this really great person in mind that could really fit. Now that is an art. And that really needs to be revived within our communities. And sometimes the more affluent we get, the more we kind of look down on those traditional practices. But those traditional practices make the best marriages, wallahu alam. Yeah. So that's that that was really my my intent inshaAllah. Yes, sister. Moving moving along. They come uh of age. Now they married, okay? And down the line, uh, because now there's a lot of uh, marriages uh, break at the early stage, even within a year. Okay, so the problem of commitment. Yes, but see, that's that that problem of commitment is because of all the. 16 year old, 17 year old, 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old, 21 year old, 22 year old experiences that they've had. They've been through 15 relationships, whether it was virtual. Some, you, you get some really strange, you know, I'll get a, a sister will say, Brother Yahya, there's a brother, I've known him for two years. I go, okay. Can you talk to my dad about him? Like she'll walk into my office at university. Can you talk? I was like, well, why? She goes, well, he's in Melbourne. I go, how'd you meet him? She goes, oh no, I haven't met him yet. Like, we, we just met him online. She thinks she's been in a relationship with a guy who she's been chatting with for two years. That's not relationships. Another one, oh, brother Yahya, you know, he's a really nice guy. And, you know, I think my dad will say no. He just needs a little bit of help if you, if you can maybe meet him first and then... Take him to my dad. You meet this guy and you say, Whoa, would I want this person for my sister? That's how I judge it. Do I have the confidence to say I would accept him for my sister? No, so I'm not going to go to your dad. And I say that. She goes, Why, brother? Why? He's really good. I go, How do you know he's good? He's so genuine. He's so open. I go, How do you know he's genuine and open? Oh, like, before I say something, it's like he knows what I'm going to say. I was like, okay, and what else? Like, I'm going to SMS him and like I get an SMS from him, like almost at the same minute. Like our hearts are together. I was like, oh, okay, and like, what does he do for a living? Uh, nothing. Uh, what's he studying? Well, he started in this, but he didn't finish, so he tried that, but it didn't work, so... <laughs> He thinking of doing this. So what you mean is, he has no hopes of finishing anything. Right? So we have to be, you know, sometimes um, for young ladies as well, especially if they don't have a positive, strong father relationship, it can be very easy for them to feel false confidence 
in someone who shows a little bit of attention, a little bit of affection, a little bit of concern to them in their life. So we have to be really guarding against that. And the more communication we have with our young ones, the better. So a lot of those relationships that break are not the arranged ones, sisters. They're usually the ones who've had a history of failed, whether virtual relationships or you know, dating in different kinds of medians up to and including marriage. So what would, what would your advice be for those mm. who have this commitment uh, problems? In other words, when is enough? Yes. <sighs> it's tough. Look, um, no one will ever have the perfect partner. <coughs> Never. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ would say to Aisha, I know when you're upset with me. And he's the perfect partner, wasallam. No one will ever have moments of just happiness. No one will ever have just, you know, uh, everything's great in life. That's not how it is. And I say this to, the, to people that, you know, are thinking of marriage all the time. Whatever reason you're choosing the person to marry, that reason is not going to matter after you marry them. Like if you, if for the boy, for the guys, if you marry a woman because she's beautiful, she dresses amazing, she styles herself well, she's got a great job, you get married, she, alhamdulillah, is blessed with carrying a child. Okay? She doesn't style herself the same because the clothing isn't comfortable. Her body's going to begin to change, which is natural, still beautiful, but changes. She's not going to have the same priorities that she had before that. And it's going to take years at times to recover to what she was like before she carried the child, if ever. Sisters, you're going to marry a guy. Why are you marry a guy? He's got a great job. He drives a nice car. He comes from a good family. Uh, he's got, alhamdulillah, good finance. Uh, okay, now you marry him. That great job sucks. Why? Because he's working at it too hard. The great car that you like, well, he's got to pay for it. How? Because of that great job that now to you sucks. Because it takes him too long. He's got nice clothes and he smells good. It's like, damn, too many people know that as well. Right? You get a little bit of jealousy. Where are you all day? Where have you been? Uh, work. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Business and this and that. Right? You start getting a little bit cuckoo. It happens so many times. I tell you. After you get married. You used to work just like he works. But now you got pregnant. And you're staying at home and you're happy. You're happy to be home with your children. But he's still doing what he used to do. And you're not doing what you used to do. So you resent him for it. So everything that you married him for, the great job, the great clothes, the great car, the great money, I hate his money, I hate his clothes, I hate his car, I hate his job, why doesn't he just stay home and help me? Everything he married her for, wow, we go out and we, we're, we look great like a couple, but now we're a couple with bags, kids, strollers, nappies, formula bottles, nannies, you know, that's life. So everything that you go into thinking is going to be the same is no longer the same. So the things that you love the most, you're not going to love the most. So there better be something else you're going to discover after you're married that you begin to love. And therefore, once you're married, then you find, as Khairul says, that's the one. Why? Because now you begin to love her for the... Things you never saw. What are the things you never saw? How she looks like without makeup. You're like, it's scary, but in a nice way. <laughs> like, I didn't know, like, it's kind of nice. <laughs> like, it's different. Wow, look at her. How she looks like when she's asleep. She's quiet. No, no, no. <laughs> Just joking, right? You know? that you help each other with young children. You look at your child and you look at her and you're like, that's us. We made that. Allah made it, but 
we like cooked it. <laughs> so serious, that's where they say the baby oven. It's like an oven, it's cooking. Right? So you begin to love each other for the things that you could not ever love each other for before marriage. And therefore for us as Muslims, it's not love and marriage, it's marriage and love. So that's the love that you want. And it's only if you get that, that you get committed. The ones who break away, Sister uh, Zaida, is the people who got married and then those things change and they're like, uh-uh, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't think it was going to be like, I, I, I still want to be living the dating life. But that's not going to happen. You're going to have to change everything in your life as your life begins to progress. And that's the reality. So you want to find the person, inshallah, that you can uh, enjoy that with. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. One last one. Brothers. Something from the brothers. Yeah, there we go. Um, are there any examples from the brothers or uh, on how you show us uh, what is the proper way to be angry with your wife or your husband? All right. The brother is asking, is there something from the life of the Prophet that talks about anger uh, as directed towards a spouse? And there are numerous you know, instances where whether the Prophet's wives were angry or whether he was angry, uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But more than just his, his, his example, there's the example of regular people as well. Um, so I'll, I'll give you two funny ones, right? Uh, there was an imam, uh, one of the like ancient masters of Islam, like a, a scholar of the past. <coughs> and his wife was really, really harsh against him. She wasn't kind to him. Uh, she wasn't kind to him privately or publicly. And people would say to him, wow, you've been married to her for so long, but she still doesn't give you any, you know the respect you deserve, everyone respects you, but she doesn't, you know, you're such a great guy, and why does she treat you this way? He goes, listen, what's between me and her is between me and her, it has nothing to do with you. He say, you could just divorce her. And he goes, no, why? I will be patient. So she passes away before him. And after they bury her, he's weeping, right? He, he's lost his wife. Even though she treated him harshly, it was his wife. But it's almost as if he's also weeping with joy. And as people are beginning to leave, he says, Hold on a second, don't go anywhere. And he points up to the heavens and he says, Oh Allah, and all of you, I bear witness in front of you that you, my wife, who's now dead, anti talaq, I divorce you. They're like, This guy's gone crazy. She's dead. How do you divorce a dead woman? He said, no, I'm divorcing her because I had such a hard life with her in the dunya. I'm scared I'm going to even have to see her in the akhirah. I don't want her to be married to me in Jannah. <laughs> that's it, you're divorced. I don't want to see you in Jannah, right? Now that's kind of like an extreme. And it kind of shows you that it doesn't matter how angry you are. Sometimes in life, there's a level of patience that we have to have in, as, as endurance. The second story comes from Umar radiallahu anhu. Now Umar, his daughter was married to the Prophet ﷺ, Hafsa. And Umar, you know, yeah, I was just telling you this guy, his feet would trail on, you know, when he's on a horse. He's this, you know, uh, uh, a warrior of Islam. But when he'd be at home, his wife would give it to him. And he goes, one night she was just giving it to me so much that it was just so much, I put my clothes on in the middle of the night and when I, I went out for a walk. And I thought, I'll go to the Prophet ﷺ, maybe I'll see the Prophet. The Prophet's usually awake at night praying. So he says, as I came near to the Prophet ﷺ, I heard the Prophet's wife also giving it to him. <laughs> and I listened for a second and I thought, wow, he's getting worse than I what I was getting. <laughs> So I, he said, I went home and I laid next to my wife. It was like, if the Prophet ﷺ can endure, surely I can endure. And that's reality, right? When it comes to anger, there's 
tolerable levels and intolerable levels. And I know we're talking about you know marriage and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I know Sister Zaida mentioned things about divorce. Divorce is not shameful. And I know in culture it's shameful. But in Islam it's not shameful if it is what is best. And I say this often, you know, divorce is not the last option. Sometimes it's the best option. Whether for you or for the kids, especially if there's violence in the home or there's you know, intolerance in the home or there's something that you just can't deal with. Uh, there are some men who are horrible. There are some women, we'll be careful, <laughs> who are, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? Sometimes divorce is an option. And the Prophet ﷺ, he divorced one of his wives, right? So it's not shameful. And many of the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, at times they were forced to divorce their wife or their wife asked them for a divorce. Um, so anger, if it is manageable and at a level that is, is acceptable, uh, that does not result in vulgarity, in physical harm, in strain in front of the children. Uh, one of the saddest realities for many families and many couples is that you see, uh, you could see the trauma that their children endure because father and mother cannot control themselves even in front of their children. And if it gets to that level, that's sinful behavior. Now you're not just oppressing each other, but you're harming your children. And that's something that we are accountable for in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all those are things that we have to keep in mind uh, when it comes to anger and, and management and, and, and so on. Now. Thank you all of this, this conversation with you this morning, my love. And I uh, appreciate it for you. Thank you. Can I just say that honestly, Wallahi, Akhi, I've had maybe 15 cups of coffee in KL. No, 60. This by far is the best one. Wallahi. By far, like by far. And even Khairul, you tricked me, brother. He said, oh, there's the best coffee in town over there somewhere. And he brought me a takeaway. It was good, but now that I taste this, something else, brother. That's good. Semi-dark roast, isn't it? Dark roast, yeah. It's very nice, mashallah. Kenyan? That's